Well, hello, everyone. I'm James Dobson, and you're listening to Family Talk, a listener-supported ministry. In fact, thank you so much for being part of that support for James Dobson Family Institute. Well, hello, everyone, and welcome back to Family Talk, the listener-supported broadcast division of the Dr. James Dobson Family Institute. For more than 40 years now, Dr. James Dobson has been using radio to communicate and connect with people everywhere and encourage families with truth and biblical principles. Through Family Talk, Dr. Dobson and his team that surrounds him are continuing that work. To learn more, visit drjamesdobson.org. And now, here is Dr. James Dobson with an important interview on the current crisis of a growing gambling industry and its threat to our society, especially to our children and young adults. He reflects on his time in the late 1990s serving on the U.S. National Gambling Impact Study Commission. Let's listen in right now. Well, greetings, everyone. I'm James Dobson, and I welcome each of you to this edition of Family Talk. We're going to deal today with a major threat to the welfare of the family. I'm talking primarily about compulsive gambling, which is a social cancer that gnaws at the soul of marriage, and it impoverishes as many as 10 million Americans. It's hard to overstate the difficulties that are created by gambling of all varieties, but especially for those who are addicted. This is a subject I happen to know something about. I was appointed in 1997 by a U.S. Senator to a National Commission on Gambling. For 18 months, uh, 10 other members and I investigated all dimensions of the issue including lotteries, horse racing, casinos, sports betting, uh, and so on. And we visited Las Vegas and as many as 10 other major gambling centers throughout the country. I mean, for 18 months, we were absorbed with it. And it was an eye-opening experience for me as a lifelong non-gambler who believes gaming, as it's euphemistically called in the industry, is a highly addictive and dangerous activity, primarily because it preys on the poor, including families that hardly have enough money to stay alive. I'll never forget taking a field trip. The entire commission took one particular time. We went to Boston, and we visited an inner city grocery store, of all things. The commissioners and I were there primarily to observe what goes on in that particular store. And it was jammed with people at the time. They were wall to wall. They were not there to buy food or supplies. They had come to purchase lottery tickets. A line had formed that went out the door and extended for a full city block, if you can believe that. I asked a woman why there were so many people there waiting to get in, and she said, because the welfare checks arrived today. It happens every month. These poor people were hoping against hope that they would hit the jackpot and be rich for the rest of their lives. I asked an elderly man who was standing there why he would spend his little bit of money on such a long shot as the lottery. And he said, because this is my retirement plan. Another man said, I'm here because this happens to be my lucky day. And I said, how do you figure that? And he said, because I hit three green traffic lights on the way here. That's what he defined as a lucky day. I asked another guy if he understood the odds against hitting the lottery and uh, that it was about uh, more than a million to one. I don't remember the exact number, but it was a lot. And uh, I asked him if he understood that. He said, no, they're not great odds against me. They're one to one. And I asked him how he came to that conclusion. And he said, well, if I play the lottery, I have a chance. If I don't play, I don't have any chance. The odds are one to one. That was his method of reasoning on something that's beyond reason. It was pitiful. 
I wondered how many children of these destitute men and women have the money for food or clothing for their kids. They had been hoodwinked by politicians who took advantage of desperate, poverty-stricken people for their own gain. Gambling is not a harmless enterprise. It hurts people terribly. On another visit, I walked through smoke-filled casinos where hundreds of elderly people had been bussed in. They do that every week. They were pumping money into slot machines, sometimes three or four machines at a time. They were all rigged against them. There's no way they could win in the long run because it's a scam. I thought gambling is designed to steal the money of people who don't understand math. I looked around at the huge, elaborate casino palaces that they were in. Anyone could figure out where that money came from to build them. Those few suckers who win at gaming tables actually turn out to lose it all because they put the money right back in. It's the best kind of reinforcement. If you win, it shows you it's possible to win, and so they turn around and spend it all and more. My greatest concern is not that compulsive gamblers get bilked. If they want to do something utterly stupid, they're free to do it. But what happens to spouses and kids and teens who don't gamble? They are victims who suffer the consequences. Well, that's our topic for today, and I want to introduce you now to two guests who are going to help by sharing their own perspective. The first is Kristen Hafflett. She's a licensed clinical social worker in the state of Colorado. She specializes in trauma, PTSD, and gambling addictions. She holds a master's degree from the University of Pittsburgh. Welcome, Kristen, to Family Talk. You and I have just met, and it's going to be fun talking to you today. Yes, I'm looking forward to it. You see how many patients per week for the purpose specifically of gambling? About a third of my caseload is um, working with people who have been affected by gambling. To put a number on it would vary each week. Right now it's a handful of people. It's a tough, tough addiction to cure, isn't it? You don't ever really cure it. No, you don't. You really enter recovery, and you maintain that recovery away from gambling because somebody who has a gambling addiction can't go back to that action. They can't be put back into that action again, or the, it just reignites everything in their brain and chemistry to continue that addiction. Do most of them come to you because they really want help or because the family members or somebody has sent them there? Good question. Usually it's the latter. Um, Sometimes I find people, they realize it for themselves because they've probably been in recovery a while and they've relapsed several times and they really get it. So they'll come to me realizing it's a problem. But I would say a majority of people first enter therapy with me for gambling problems because somebody has pushed them to it, whether it's their job, their finances, yes. their spouse, their family in general, just because of the turmoil it's caused. I just described it in my introduction as a family tragedy. Do you agree with that? Yes, it's always been taught to me, and I, and by seeing it too, I agree. It's um, the whole family's involved because it affects everybody on multiple levels. So it really does impact the family. I agree. You know, in my 43, 44 years on the radio. We've received millions of pieces of mail, and this is one thing they write us about. It's not the gambler who writes. It's his wife or her husband who is desperately trying to find an answer for an unanswerable problem. What's the rate at which you really get someone established without the need for gambling? That's tough to pinpoint. Um, I don't get to follow people very long after they leave therapy. I don't always get the outcome, you know, 10 years down the road if they've maintained it. You know, at least half of the people I see, if they're really ready for change, that percentage is higher. They've got to want it. They've got to want it, right. Um, So if they're in the right stage of change and they make the appropriate changes for their recovery, then they maintain it. They might have a slip here or there, but they get right back on again and they 
you know, rebuild their finances, improve their relationships, have a happier marriage. Well, later in our interview today, I want you to describe how you go about treating them. Sure. And my other guest is my son, Ryan Dobson, who brought this topic to me for consideration. We were on the telephone, and you began, Ryan, talking about how terrible it is and what it's doing to the American family. Mm. And I said, let's do a program. Ryan has a BA from Biola University. He's an author, a public speaker, and a podcaster. Uh, he helped me found Family Talk in 2010 when he was a co-host with me for six years before starting his own podcast ministry called Rebel Parenting. Ryan, it's really good to have you back. It's good to be here. Thanks for having me. You've been listening to the conversation. Yeah. You're very concerned about this too, aren't you? Definitely, uh, especially because of the rise. Um, I remember you being on the Gambling Commission uh, and learning how much of it was backed by organized crime and that the government knew it. And I just remember thinking, well, why do you put up with that? You know this is a bad thing. You know it attracts a horrible element. The radius around gambling establishments attracts crime, uh, destitute, poverty, broken home. You name Prostitution. it. Prostitution. It's everything. always every bad thing is around those gambling yeah. centers. And now... With online gambling and gambling via your phone, I mean, it has exploded across the world, exploded every franchise. I mean, from MLB to the UFC has programming aimed at gamblers. They have 45 minute specials before every UFC pay-per-view with gambling quote unquote experts from the sponsor talking about how you should or shouldn't bet on these fights. Every sporting event has something like that. And it's getting worse all the time. Every day. You mentioned the um, politicians who aren't interested in doing anything to curb yeah. this activity. I wonder why. Yeah, I wonder why. Follow the money. That's right. Uh, you know, when I was on the gambling commission, mm -hmm. there was no gambling on college sports. Right. Right. That's a recent thing. And yeah. we did everything we could mm -hmm. dealing with Republicans, mind you, who are in the control of the House and Senate. Yeah. We had the votes to have continued to make it illegal. Of course. But uh, they would not bring it to the floor because they get so much money in contributions. That's right. Got they bought out. pay them off. Yeah. They buy them off. you got to say Republican with quotes. Yeah. You know, yes. I don't think the average listener understands. It's not just, you know, people think, oh, a multi billion dollar industry. It's $255 billion a year annually globally. I mean, th that's a staggering it number. Is staggering. And by the way, honestly, we're not really even talking about the Las Vegases of the world. That's 25% of gambling is in person in a casino gambling. We're talking 75% of that $255 billion every year, and it's growing exponentially, is all online. It's all phone and computer. Go and that's there why, to Las Vegas and look around, and you'll see what I was talking about, about these oh, palaces yeah. and the, the billions and billions of dollars spent yeah. on casinos. You see why it's there. I have family out right outside of Las Vegas, and the building never stops. It never stops. I mean, you talked about the chance of winning. The chance of winning Mega Millions is 1 in 330 million. It's yeah. 1 in 330 million. Right now, but around— But the odds are 1 to 1. <laughs> yeah. Well, and you know where they get that from? Great ad campaigns. Do you remember what the ad campaign for the lotto is? What's that? Got to be in it to win it. Yeah. It's catchy. Yeah. It makes sense. Hey, if you don't play, you can't win. That's where he gets it from. It's so sad because it's it's this false sense of hope that lets you down over it. About half of America currently plays the lottery. That saddens me greatly. And on average, they're spending more than $1,000 a year on the lottery. Tell me this. Have you ever heard a sermon on it from the pulpit? Oh, my goodness. I don't think I've ever heard gambling mentioned one time. Not not a sermon, let alone I've even never mentioned. Heard it mentioned. No, yeah. it's it's fun. It's you know, it's harmless. They think it's harmless. I don't hear it talked about as an issue anywhere outside of the mental health community. Anywhere outside of people like you. Right. No one's talking about it. And you can speak to this far more than me. I, you know, I'm into it. We deal with addiction on rebel parenting all the time. Uh, primarily. 
uh, drugs, alcohol, pornography. Okay. Um, we haven't had a lot on gambling. For those that go, hey, listen, I set aside 50 bucks a month. It's entertainment. It's all I spend. It's no big deal. I handle it well. I'm asking people, yes, I understand that you can. But as a whole, it is so bad. We shouldn't allow this. And, the gambling addiction. And if you do, your kids probably will. Yeah. So well, that you're setting them up right. and they may not be able to handle it as well as you are. Most addiction, it's a constant reward system. You take uh, alcohol, heroin, cocaine, uh, whatever. Right. If you build a tolerance, you take more, you get high again. You build a tolerance, you take more, you get high again. Gambling is a variable reward system. You can't Correct. predict when you're going to get that high of winning, which is why it's so much harder to kick a gambling habit than it is a regular Schedule One drug, you know, or an opioid or prescription habit. Gambling is really dug into people. It is, and it has the same tolerance component. It just looks different than the increased amount of the substance, right? So mm. um, if you have a gambling addiction, then you will bet more and more money. You increase your bet over over time, and the tolerance for that, because you want a bigger win or you want to feel more of a rush or more in action, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, it does have a tolerance component. Again, it just looks different because it's a process versus a substance. Sure. In your graduate training, you probably heard about intermittent reinforcement. Correct, yes. And how it's the most powerful mm -hmm. form of reinforcement. If you won every time and then you stop being reinforced, you quit. But if you never know when it's going to hit, mm -hmm. when you're going to win, mm -hmm. it keeps you there. Right. Uh, that's why they don't put clocks in casinos. They don't want you to even think about what time yep. it is. You mm -hmm. sit there till the middle of the night mm -hmm. or all night or days. Right. I mean, it's, it has an unbelievable hold on people, doesn't it? Yes, it sure can. Yeah, it does. And when it's bad, it's, it's pretty bad for people. When patients come in to see you for this reason, uh, do you have to convince them that it's not a good thing? Or do they come in knowing that this is really not real smart? Yes and no, because gambling mm -hmm. is tricky. Um, there's, you know, some fallacy involved in that, too. The gambler, you know, you have the kind of the illusion of control when you're gambling. You think, oh, OK, well, I have, you know, whether it's um, like a lucky rabbit's foot or just the idea that, you know, the game or you can beat the odds. It's just this illusion that people have. So they still hang on to that illusion of control, while maybe they also think, this isn't helping. Maybe this is a problem. So they kind of go back and forth between the two of those until they've really realized or hit their bottom or just got, come to the realization yeah. that I need to stop this. It's not helping. Have mm. either of you heard the term chasing? Yeah. In that sense, it has a particular meaning. Chasing is when you begin gambling more than you have you begin mm -hmm. getting yourself into a terrible hole that you've got to go home and explain to somebody. Chasing is when you have overdone it and you have lost nearly everything and you realize there are going to be great consequences. Then you start making your bets on the basis of getting that back. Mm -hmm. You begin chasing, chasing an answer. And you do mm -hmm. really stupid things yeah. because you're panicked and you, you're you desperate. Uh, this is going to cost you your family. This is going to maybe cost you your job. And then you got to figure out where you're going to go to borrow the money to make up for it. Mm -hmm. So you start chasing a vigorous, just vigorously. It is the source of the worst, the end game of this terrible addiction. Yeah. Right, you said something exactly. a minute ago. Uh, casinos will ban you from gambling just if you win too much. Yeah. That's it. I mean, so Dana White is the president of the UFC. He's a notorious gambler. And there are a number of casinos that won't let him come and play because he's won too much. He's done what everybody wants to do. He's done what they give you a promise for. You can win untold million. No, no, no. Actually, there's a certain amount we'll let you win, and then we won't ever let you come back That's again. That's why it's rigged. Yeah. There's, even if you beat the system, mm -hmm. it's rigged. Yeah. They're not going to allow you to succeed at it because they're there to take your money away yeah. from you and to leave you destitute. 
By the way, and that's just the very few games where there is a statistical possibility that you might have closer to an even shot with a casino. I mean, they rig, they stack it against you. Listen, not, they stack it against you in so many ways at the establishment. When you were studying gambling, Dad, I remember you talking about how they were data mining credit card companies to look for impulse buyers. Do you remember this? Yes. Think yeah. about that. This is yeah. the interesting thing. An impulse buyer probably has a penchant for addiction. That you know, they just can't help themselves. And you start luring people into gambling knowing there's a high percentage that will become addicted and suffer those consequences. That seems criminal. You know, there were 11 of us on this commission and they put us in the suites oh. where they put the high rollers. And it was breathtaking. Yeah. They're in Las Vegas, these gigantic multi-billion dollar buildings. And the the suites they put us in were two stories. You had a, a staircase that goes up to the second floor. It's unbelievable what they do to entice you. And then they give you rolls of quarters or, or whatever the denomination is. Uh, Kristen, <laughs> uh, talk about how you approach a hardcore compulsive gambler, mm. where do you start? What is your first measure? So assessing the severity, of course, because um, I'll get, it's not just casino gambling either. It could be people stock market trading, mm. that they consume a lot of their time with That's that. That's another form of it. It isn't is. It? It's another form. So I see all forms. So sometimes, depending on the form, will influence how the treatment goes, but always initially just assessing the severity. Um, you know, in the beginning stages of therapy, we do a really thorough um, financial assessment. Who do you owe? Who have you ever borrowed money from? Because part mm -hmm. of the recovery is paying back what you've borrowed. Um, you know, and, and this, of course, is if they're on board. So sometimes I use a lot of motivational interviewing to get them to weigh the pros and cons of gambling or not gambling. You know, we can engage in harm reduction practices, too. Init the goal of harm reduction is abstinence. But um, with gambling, not all games put gamblers into action. So sometimes they can eliminate say blackjack is the worst for them, maybe they can still go buy a lottery ticket. Mm. It's kind of a way to work with them to, so you yeah. don't have to give it all up at first and just see how they can do with it. Um, so a lot of it is trying to get them to figure out, do you really have a problem? Do you really want to stop? And if so, like what, which approach are we going to take? Um, so that's where I start with them. Is there a Gamblers Anonymous like uh, yes. alcohol? Yes, absolutely. Anonymous? There is. Um, but there is, And there's also Gammonon for the family members, just like Al-Anon for yes. family members. Mm -hmm. um, and with the COVID pandemic, too, there's a website, um, Gamblers in Recovery, where you can literally log on the website and all over the world you could log into a meeting. There's Chances are you're, you can enter one live meeting online at that moment that you log in. Mm -hmm. I've had people really enjoy those. A powerful beginning to this critical discussion on the invasive and destructive power of gambling right here on Dr. James Dobson's Family Talk. Now, Dr. Dobson was joined today by his son, Ryan Dobson, and licensed social worker and gambling addiction specialist, Kristen Hafflett. The three will continue their conversation on tomorrow's program. But before we go, I want to leave you with a few statistics on gambling today. Approximately 10 million Americans have a gambling addiction. The gambling industry alone brings in about $255 billion globally every year, and one in every 25 teens has a gambling problem. These numbers are sobering. Gambling, after all, encourages many destructive and sinful behaviors, including greed and selfishness. It discourages faith and trust in God's promises to meet all of our needs. It also undermines a biblical work ethic with its appeal to get rich quick, if you will. But as with all circumstances, there is always hope in Christ. Make sure you join us again tomorrow as Dr. Dobson, Ryan Dobson, and Kristen Hafflett will discuss some of the warning signs that a loved one might have a gambling problem. You will not want to miss that conversation. They'll also be talking about action steps to take if you or a family member has a gambling addiction. So please be sure to join us. To learn more about Family Talk and for links for helpful resources pertaining to gambling addiction, we encourage you to visit drjamesdobson.org. That's drjamesdobson.org forward slash broadcast. 
Remember, you can always give us a call as well. Our number is 877-732-6825. We're here for you 24-7, and we love getting your phone calls. So remember that number, 877-732-6825. And of course, if you or someone you know is struggling with a gambling addiction, here at Family Talk, we urge you to get in touch with the Gamblers Anonymous group in your area. Help and healing are possible. Go to gamblersanonymous.org to learn more. That's gamblersanonymous.org. You can also call the National Problem Gambling Helpline at 1-800-522-4700. That's 800-522-4700. Thanks again for listening to Family Talk today. From all of us here at the Dr. James Dobson Family Institute, God's richest blessings to you and your family. This has been a presentation of the Dr. James Dobson Family Institute.